Good evening. I'm Matt Jacobs, director of the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Tonight, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Dr. Patricia Hilliard Nunn Sankofa Initiative, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, the History Department, African American Studies Program, the Rothman Endowment and the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere, the Political Science Department, and of course, the Bob Graham Center for Public Service as well. We're excited to welcome this evening Dr. Vincent Brown for the second event in a series that had its origins in the work of a group of undergraduates who are exploring the relationship between the intersecting histories of slavery and the founding of the University of Florida. Before proceeding, I do want to note that Dr. Brown will speak for approximately 30 minutes or so, and then we will open the conversation for audience Q&A. You will submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I would now like to welcome Dr. David Canton, the director of our African American Studies program here at the University of Florida, to introduce our speaker for the evening. Dr. Canton. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time to come to this great event. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Canton, the director of the African American Studies program, and it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Vincent Brown. But I'll just say a few words. If you look at Dr. Brown's research, you talk about African American studies, right? Looking at phenomena from an African, African American perspective, this is what makes his research so, so, so excellent, right? That we get to see that African American studies has always been transnational from day one. You know, that people of African descent have always made these connections across the across the diaspora intellectually, culturally, and socially. So I think oftentimes we forget to give African American studies that credit when transnationalism became a big thing in traditional disciplines. African studies have been doing this since 1900, from the Pan-African conferences with W.E. Du Bois, Afro-Caribbeans, African scholars. This has always been a conversation about how people of African descent can organize to fight against colonialism, slavery, negritude, Harlem Renaissance. So it's an ongoing, continuing conversation. It'll be great to listen to Dr. Brown's talk this evening. Vincent Brown is Charles Warren Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University, and the co-founder of Timestamp Media. His research, writing, teaching, and other creative endeavors are focused on the political dimensions of cultural practice in the African diaspora, with a particular emphasis on the early modern Atlantic world. P Professor Brown's first book, The Reaper's Garden, Death and Power in the World of Atlantic Slavery, was co-winner of the 2009 Merle, Cur Merle Curti Award and received the 2009 James A. Rawley Prize and the 2008-2009 Louis Gulschalk Prize. His most rec recent book is Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war, which was awarded eight national prizes. And without further ado, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Canton, for that very generous introduction, and also to Professor Jacobs for hosting. Um, I want to thank also uh, Marion Vernonson uh, for helping to coordinate my visit, also Leah Honecker, Dorothy Zimmerman, and Ava Cavalcante for, for helping to organize our session today. I'm, I'm very grateful and honored to be here. And I want to thank all of you who joined me this evening <clears throat> to hear a little bit about Taki's Revolt, uh, the story of an Atlantic slave war. And I don't want anybody to get scared. This is not gonna be critical race theory, um, but, I, but I am glad just in case that uh, there's no extradition treaty between Florida and Massachusetts. So I am safe here where I am in Cambridge and I can talk to you freely about the subject of slave revolt. So let's jump right in uh, and leave ourselves plenty of time for questions at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here uh, so that you can all see the slides that I've got <clears throat> for you and then I'll begin speaking for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and then I think we should have time for, for questions at the end. So few people know that in 1776, Great Britain's most important American colony was on the verge of insurrection. Colonists perceived that the government in Britain was conspiring against the rights of imperial subjects. They feared a plot against the English liberties they had long enjoyed. At their dinner tables, they heatedly discussed the merits of open sedition. Those disaffected with imperial governance dwelled upon the topic of American rebellion. As these Jamaican colonists debated liberty, their slaves saw an opportunity. 
The island was at a critical juncture with the British entry into yet another imperial war. Colonists traded exaggerated accounts of a French and Spanish military buildup in the Caribbean and calculated that there were 30 slaves to every white person ready to join the attempts of any enemy in a general massacre, they said. On July 3rd, 1776, a regiment of troops left Hanover Parish for the rendezvous at Port Royal, scheduled to depart the island for North America by the end of the month. Throughout that parish, enslaved people gathered frequently in houses, grounds, and open fields to hold very serious conversations, which stopped suddenly upon the approach of anyone they did not trust. They were strategizing. Now or never, they thought, was the time to make themselves masters of the country. The moment seemed ripe for a successful uprising, but this American Revolution was not to be. As so often happened with slave rebellions, the plot was betrayed and the conspiracy unraveled. When the British in Jamaica considered the gravity of their predicament in 1776, rather than looking ahead to the loss of the 13 colonies on the North American colonies, continent, they looked to the past, back to the slave insurrection of 1760, which had been the most dangerous threat to the British empire to date. They reflected on the differences between the unrest of 1760 and 1776, mostly in terms of the nature of warfare with their own slaves. In April, 1760, an enslaved West African chief called Taki staged a massive uprising against brutal conditions on the island of Jamaica, then the most profitable of Great Britain's 26 American colonies. Over the next 18 months, as their numbers grew into the thousands, the rebels thwarted an initial crackdown, conducting a skillful guerrilla campaign against the might of the British Empire. Plantations were destroyed. Dozens of whites were killed. It was a war within a war. As Britain fought for imperial supremacy in Europe's first global conflict, the Seven Years' War, then raging across five continents, enslaved Black people fought to throw off the violent yoke of colonial rule. Shaken by the scale of the revolts, Britain's colonial forces eventually responded with overwhelming force killing and brutally executing at least 500 black men and women. Hundreds more people were transported from the island for life. But the brutal British response could not contain the revolt's consequences, which included an amplification of anti-black racism, the emergence of a movement to abolish the slave trade, and perhaps most surprisingly, a reorganization of the British empire that provoked another rebellion on the North American continent. 1776 customarily marks a moment in the origin of the United States of America, of course, when the Declaration of Independence announced the separation of the 13 colonies from Great Britain. When referring to the origins of the nation, though, the date obscures the broader context of the times. It deflects attention from the fact that Britain held 26 colonies in America, not just the 13 that broke away, and that by far the most profitable, militarily significant, and politically connected of them were in the Caribbean. This chart compares private wealth in various regions of Great Britain's empire in 1774. It divides the territories into England and Wales, British America as a whole, and then the 13 North American colonies that became the United States, those in the British Caribbean, and then it divides the 13 colonies into three regions, Southern, Mid-Atlantic, and New England. As you can see, Colonists on the continent held nearly 70% of the wealth in British America, largely because the total population of property holders was much greater than in the Caribbean. But when you break North America down by region, you see that wealth increased as you move south. That is, according to the degree the colonial economy depended upon in slave labor. And when you examine the average amount of property held per free white person, an astonishing disparity leaps out. In the British Caribbean, where some 90% of the population was made up of enslaved black people, free white people were stupendously rich, boasting more than 17 times the wealth of those in the 13 colonies. Indeed, the average private wealth of a free white colonist in Jamaica, the single most lucrative American colony, was nearly 58 times greater than that of a similar settler in New England. Military deployments were distributed to protect that wealth. The British Royal Navy kept its three main stations at Port Royal, Jamaica, established in 1696, 
English Harbor, Antigua in 1731, and Halifax, Nova Scotia after 1749, two in the Caribbean and one in Canada. Often there were nearly as many warships assigned to Jamaica as to the whole of the North American continent. Jamaica's planters and merchants wielded greater influence in the imperial metropolis than their North American peers, which goes some way to explaining why poor Governor Thomas Hutchinson of Massachusetts couldn't get as much support as he needed as soon as he wanted from British policymakers when rebels rose up in that marginal colony in the 1770s. Before that American Revolution, the British were well aware that the event we now know as Tacky's Revolt represented the peak of imperial crisis and slave revolt was generally a source of overwhelming concern. One planter who had lived through the upheaval wrote that, whether we consider the extent and secrecy of its plan, the multitude of the conspirators and the difficulty of opposing its eruptions in such a variety of places at once, this revolt was more formidable than any hitherto known in the West Indies. According to two slaveholders who wrote histories of the Jamaican conflict, one of them being Edward Long, pictured here, the rebellion was organized and executed principally by people called Coromantes from the Gold Coast, the West African region stretching between the Como and Volta rivers, who had an established reputation for military prowess. Their displacement, forced migration, and rebellion shows how the slave trade shaped what I call the diasporic warfare that convulsed the 18th century Atlantic world. The transatlantic slave trade spread people from Atlantic Africa throughout the Americas. Some who had been leaders or soldiers suddenly found themselves uprooted from sustaining landscapes, scattered by currents and trade winds, and replanted in unfamiliar territories where they labored to rebuild their social lives. Inevitably, some of them determined that only war could end their bondage. This process of dispersal from a native land, transplantation and adaptation to a new and strange one is familiar to students of cultural change who have examined transformations in African religion, expression and identity by viewing African American and Atlantic history in a common frame. A similar approach shows how the turmoil of enslavement and the daily hostilities of life in plantation society generated a militant response that traveled, took root and sprouted in rebellions that reverberated across the Americas and back to Europe. That is what happened when those called Coromantes broke out in a series of revolts and conspiracies in the 17th and 18th centuries, most dramatically in Cartagena, Suriname, St. John, New York, Antigua, and Jamaica, an archipelago of insurrections stretching throughout the North Atlantic Americas. The Jamaican insurrections of 1760 to 61, followed by further uprisings in 65 and 66, were among the largest and most consequential of these. From what observers could glean of the aims and tactics of the rebels, it was clear that many had been soldiers in Africa. Perhaps whole cadres of people arrived in the Americas with military training and discipline, or at least some knowledge of defensive and evasive tactics learned in Africa. Indeed, as some scholars suggest, American slave revolts might be seen in key respects as extensions of African wars. Viewing slave revolt as a species of warfare is thus the first step to envisioning a map of Atlantic slavery that shows how political and military practices travel, take root, and grow in disparate environments. Even as the slave trade forced people to remake and renegotiate their affiliations, the massive dispersal of Africans across the Atlantic scattered the seeds of military conflict throughout the Americas. The story of the Coromantes shows how African warfare was reconstituted, not as a direct continuation of previous struggles, but as an outgrowth of immigrant experiences. British slaveholders valued Coromantes highly. Planters stereotyped them as best suited for agricultural labor, and they had reputations uh, for military bearing and discipline. They were often employed in command and supervisory roles in plantation work gangs, and sometimes played subservient roles in the armed forces, including the Royal Navy. But the British also said that Coromantes were particularly rebellious and prone to uprisings. They were dangerous people to keep in bondage in part for the same reason slave traders found the Gold Coast to be an abundant source of potential workers. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the region witnessed the transformation of major empires, Denshira, 
a Kwamu, Akim, and Ashante, among dozens of smaller polities which vie with each other in the reason, region. The battles that attended these conflicts, stimulated by the trade for European firearms, produced great quantities of war captives for sale to the Europeans on the coast. They also pr produced a turbulent environment in which complex military campaigns involved both European and African rivalries, multiple alliances, negotiations, and treachery. In fact, people from the Gold Coast did not form anything like a single ethnic group in Africa. So who were the Coromantes? According to the best research on the subject, they were members of a loosely structured organization of co-nationals who socialized with and aided one another, forming what contemporaries called a nation in the Americas. As a basis of social communion, in an environment where militarism was a common experience, national gatherings could also provide a forum for people to plan, organize, and wage revolts. When they did so, they drew upon their previous military experiences. However, as what you should probably call a category of belonging, Coromanti was cross-cut by many other axes of identification. Coromanti spoke more than one language and came from many different regions and kingdoms from which they brought a variety of historical experiences. Just as importantly, once in Jamaica, they served different roles in the slave society. No amount of cultural similarity could resolve all the difficult negotiations of multiple interests and experiences among them. Even with their compatriots, enslaved Africans made friends and foes through a politics of belonging that made the debate about what it meant to be Coromanti in Jamaica as urgent as the forging of that identity itself. In the face of continual assaults on their personal dignity, slaves distinguished themselves by their political commitments as much as by ascribed classifications. Among the Coromantes, different ideas of how to live in slave society how to evade its worst abuses, and how to destroy it altogether, shaped their rebellions even as they recalled their prior experiences in Africa. In the turbulent world of Atlantic warfare, nothing was more important than learning where and how to form loyal units, alliances, and coalitions in the face of superior power. The enslaved had won this wisdom through hard experience on the Gold Coast before coming to America, where they learned it anew and with different particulars in order to make war on their masters. The former slave and Royal Navy veteran, Olauda Equiano, famously defined slavery itself as a perpetual state of war. This was not war in the conventional sense between distinct armies directed by the rulers of states. Rather, mastery was by nature a forceful assault to be met with simmering violence ignited by the resentment against the fraud, rapine, and cruelty of slaveholders. To the enslavers, Equiano asked, are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? And it was not a rhetorical question. Since the early years of Jamaica's slave society, slaveholders had often considered the enslaved as irreconcilable yet intestine enemies, made subject to the colonists only by the rule of the whip. Equiano had been in Jamaica in 1772 when the island was still reeling from the uprisings of the previous decade. There, he had seen how an entire world could be organized around violence and counterattack. He had held this view in common with Black people in other times and places, where the enslaved often characterized their bondage as a permanent state of low intensity war, talking regularly about how they might wage that war. Now, this description might be more familiar now than it would have been a generation ago. Military theorists have become increasingly interested in warfare between great powers and improvised militias. Conflict dispersed over wide areas with largely undefined battle lines and blurred distinctions between civilians and combatants. These current trends in the study of warfare recommend a re-examination of the martial geography of Atlantic slavery too. Warfare migrates. This has never been more apparent than in the era when the violence of imperial expansion and enslavement transformed Europe, Africa, and the Americas as they interacted across the Atlantic Ocean. European imperial conflict extended the dominion of capitalist agriculture. African battles fed captives to the transatlantic trade in slaves. Masters and their human properties struggled with one another continuously. These clashes amounted to what I call a borderless slave war war to enslave, war to expand slavery, and war against slaves 
precipitating wars waged by the enslaved against slaveholders. In this sense, Tacky's revolt was but a war within other wars, which had diverging and overlapping provocations, combat zones, political alliances, and enemy combatants. In effect, it combined four conflicts at once. It was an extension of wars on the African continent. It was a race war between black slaves and white slave holders. It was a struggle among black people over the terms of their communal belonging for effective control of local territory and the establishment of their own political legacies. And it was most immediately one of the hardest fought battles of the Seven Years War, the titanic global conflict between Great Britain and its European rivals. Each of these four struggles emerged from different currents that converged and eddied in the Jamaican insurrections of the 1760s. Charting their course suggests new stories of place, territory, and movement, a new cartography of slave revolt that braids together the histories of Europe, Africa, and America. As an example, one of the revolt's principal leaders, a man called Wager, also known by his African name Opongo, fought in each kind of these campaigns. He was an elite official on the Gold Coast, trading with British forts and probably engaging in combat with political rivals. Captured and enslaved by a Royal Navy ship captain, he fought in naval battles against the French alongside other Africans from the Gold Coast. He was one among dozens of other black mariners employed at Jamaica who constituted about a quarter of all the crews plying the island shipping lanes at the time. After Wager's discharge from the warship, he was a driver on that captain's sugar plantation, helping to keep other workers in subjection for a time before he came to lead the uprising the British could fairly call a race war. As he engaged in these successive struggles, he connected the small scale everyday violence of enslavement and coerced labor to the grand scale of imperial geopolitics. The hemispheric reach of these conflicts mapped interlocking patterns of state, commerce, migration, labor, and militancy. Across vast distances, these wars within wars connected the constituent elements of empire, diaspora, and insurrection. Such an integrated history of slave revolt takes us far from the plantations, beyond relations between masters and slaves, and outside the conventional locations for observing racial violence. Vectors of slave war in Jamaica formed a knot in the intertwined itineraries of soldiers who fought in Europe, North America, and Africa, sailors who crisscrossed the Atlantic world for merchants and empires, and slaves who were swept up in many conflicts on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm gonna hope that uh, you all will read my account for yourselves of the revolt. Uh, it's available in paperback as of, as of about a month ago, um, and you can get a glimpse of the way the revolt uh, unfolded on these maps here. I'm sorry, they're a little small probably on your screens, but those maps are in the book as well. For now, what I wanna do is just sketch out what I think are some of the underappreciated reverberations of what was called Tacky's revolt to give you a sense of why I think the insurrection was so consequential and how I hope the book can model the kinds of connections that braid events in distant locales across long spans of time. Fertaki's revolt anticipated the American Revolution by a decade and a half and the Haitian Revolution by three decades. It can be considered one of the first great events of what historians call the age of revolution. And yet it's hardly known outside of Jamaica to people who aren't historians of the British Empire or Atlantic slavery. This is despite the fact that it influenced two of the signal moments of the era, the reorganization of British imperial governance that so irritated colonists in North America and the early beginning of the movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. So I'll talk about each of those in turn now. In the aftermath of the revolt, to recoup some of the public costs, Jamaica's House of Assembly passed new poll taxes and commercial duties. The colonial government also committed to a tax on vellum, parchment, and paper ascertained by stamps, something that imperial reformers would attempt a few years later for all of America. The Jamaica Stamp Act of 1760 was meant explicitly to address the cost of the revolt. The duty remained in force until December 1763, when it was repealed as too great a burden for all but the wealthiest colonists. As a model for the more contentious 1765 Stamp Act that would rile the colonists in North America, the 1760 tax was an early local instance of a far larger reform effort stimulated by the Seven Years' War, 
as imperial policymakers in Britain celebrated military victories in North America, Africa, and the Caribbean during that war, they contemplated the threat to their most vital colony. On November 7th, 1760, two weeks after the death of King George II, the Board of Trade considered official accounts of the Jamaica insurrection, which raised the urgent question of how an expanding empire might contain its internal antagonists. In this liminal moment for imperial management, a new policy would take shape. British statesmen had worried over the governance of the Americas, over America for uh, more than a decade, since the conclusion of the previous war with France and Spain in 1748. The colony's demographic, economic, and strategic value had increased dramatically in the first half of the 18th century, and the complexity of administering them had grown in tandem. British members of parliament were spurred into a reform effort, partly by the behavior of North American colonists during the Seven Years' War. In the midst of that conflict, colonial assemblies flouted the authority of governors. Elected officials allowed flagrant violations of the Navigation Acts against trading with the enemy, and colonists often failed to supply enough local troops and resources to the war effort. As the historian Jack P. Green has explained, this coincided with a dramatic shift from an essentially permissive to a fundamentally restrictive philosophy of colonial administration in London, amplifying the widespread conviction that the colonies had too many privileges and that those privileges ought to be reduced. News of the slave war in Jamaica's mo in, in Great Britain's most profitable colony strengthened the policymakers' resolve. In this, they were helped by a shift in attitude among colonists in Jamaica. Jamaican colonists had previously been as restive and independent as their North American counterparts, but the slave insurrection reminded slaveholders of the benefits of empire. And they soon conveyed their gratitude, along with a request for more troops, to the new king, George III, and the Lords of Trade. The colonial assembly thanked the king. If not for his majesty's forces, they wrote, the lives and properties of your loyal subjects would in all likelihood have become a prey to their slaves. Like North American colonists, slaveholders in Jamaica resented the influence of metropolitan intervention, as well as the imposition of new taxes. However, unlike so many in North America, their recent experience with slave revolt encouraged them to remain duly subject to imperial command, even passing that stamp act to help finance their own security. They did not like many imperial reforms, but they acquiesced to them. After the Seven Years' War, with Jamaica having served as a model for the assertion of imperial control, policymakers preferred a raft of new legislation for their North American colonies. Yet unlike colonial Jamaica's submission, these, policies, these policies inspired the well-known backlash that would ultimately split the British Empire in 1776. If the Jamaican insurrections helped to shape policy toward the colonies, they also offered a rationale for the reform of colonial slavery. Fearing further rebellion, concerned Britons put forth pragmatic plans for enhancing the security of the colonies by limiting their dependence on the slave trade and ameliorating the condition of the enslaved. Ironically, perhaps perversely, the work of the historian planter Edward Long had a significant impact on a budding anti-slavery discourse. Long argued that the slave revolt was, and slave revolt in general, was a criminal trait of the Coromante people, and his fearful hatred of Coromantes fed his loathing for Africans in general. Indeed, through a chain of association linking various unwelcome traits, blackness in general came to signify the, the, the potential for danger that Long attributed most specifically to Coromantes. In the end, regardless of their differences, Long surmised that Black people must actually constitute a different species of humankind. And for this view, Long has justifiably been called an early proponent of scientific racism, which gained currency in the 18th century as writers sought to classify and rank the world's peoples. More immediately though, Long's racism was as much a specific reaction to Black political agency as it was a general theory of human difference. His views projected his experience of the fragility of white mastery in the West Indies, where slaveholders had recently been frustrated, at times even humiliated in their attempts to pacify the enslaved. Though he thought that slavery was unavoidably necessary in his terms for the increase of English commerce, he viewed the African presence as an unqualified evil. One of the more enduring myths, of course, in the corpus of racial fantasy is that white people are underdogs, besieged by hypermasculine and ultraviolent blacks. Slave revolt engendered this trope. In his reaction to Jamaica's slave war in the 1760s, Long became one of the most erudite and prominent purveyors of racial panic. 
nurturing a virulent strain of nationalist discourse that would infect the political imagination of many whites down to the present day. In arguing that the principal threat to colonial slavery were African and especially Coromante insurgents, Long promoted the idea that a native born slave population would be more tractable. He thought that if planters could avoid working their slaves to death, as they often did, attach them to estates rather than continuing to scatter them by sale, establish better conditions for child rearing and encourage the progress of Christianity, then slaveholders might be more secure in their possessions. They could also save money on the ever rising prices of imported laborers from Africa. Raising up native born populations would facilitate what reformers constantly referred to as the improvement of the plantations and would lead to a kinder and gentler and less menacing slavery. Through, through the beginning of the 19th century, people who campaigned against the slave trade would invoke Long's text to argue that ending the traffic would enhance the internal security of the British Empire. In this way, Jamaica's turbulence indirectly helped to nurture the emerging anti-slave trade movement. And fear of Africans had indeed inspired the first efforts to restrict the transatlantic trade. Responding to a 1712 uprising, African uprising in New nearby New York, the Pennsylvania Assembly imposed a prohibitive 20 pound duty on slave importations, citing diverse plots and insurrections, not only in the islands, but on the mainland of America as the reason for their action. After a revolt near South Carolina's Stono River in 1739, that colony enacted a 10 year moratorium on the importation of Africans, but planters soon found they could not do without them. Amid news of Jamaica's troubles in the 1760s, other colonies tried again. Virginia's legislators attempted to levy increased duties on imported slaves in 1767, 1769, and 1772. As Virginia's governor explained to British officials, colonists had, quote, just cause to apprehend the most dangerous consequence of importing Africans and should find means not only of preventing their increase, but also of lessening their number. He believed that the interests of the country would, he said, manifestly require the total expulsion of them. Influenced more by merchant interests than by colonial concerns, London disallowed all three of these Virginia duty acts. Restrictions on the slave trade were more successful in Pennsylvania. In 1761, with news of Jamaica's slave war regularly appearing in the Pennsylvania Gazette, the colony passed a law to increase the import duties on slaves and extend its enforcement in perpetuity. In 1773, Pennsylvania doubled the impost. And finally, in 1780, the colony passed an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. As much as these laws might have incre uh, expressed increasing opposition to the practice of slaveholding, and they did, they were also security measures aimed at discouraging the arrival of potentially insurgent Africans. If most white colonists feared the presence of Africans, many others empathized with their plight. In the abolition movement's early beginnings, African rebels often drew sympathetic responses, especially from people in places that held fewer numbers of slaves than the Caribbean. Many British and North American readers were horrified by the brutality of their British co-nationals and more so than by that of the rebels. Accounts of the execution circulated more widely with the growing popularity of sentimental literature and Christian martyrology, which helped the British to imagine their nation as a moral community founded in persecution, death, and religious virtue. For some, this imagined community extended to include the enslaved, however tenuously and African rebels came to be seen as victims sacrificed to the cruel tyranny of slave holders. One pamphlet that circulated during the 1760 revolt, J. Fillmore's two dialogues on the man trade, argued that given the terrors of enslavement, nature's higher law authorized violence against enslavers. And I'm quoting at length, all the black men now on our plantations who are by unjust force deprived of their liberty and held in slavery as they have none upon earth to appeal to may lawfully repel that force with force and to recover their liberty, destroy their oppressors. And not only so, but it is the duty of others, white as well as black, to assist those miserable creatures if they can in their attempts to deliver themselves out of slavery and rescue them out of the hands of their cruel tyrants. Now, few others are willing to go this far, at least in print, but the pamphlet influenced Anthony Benazette the Pennsylvania Quaker who laid the intellectual foundations for slave trade abolition in the British Empire. 
Although he avoided the topic of slave revolts, he frequently invoked higher law doctrine against the trade in human beings. Among his fellow Quakers, a fervent opposition to war induced them to see the violence stimulated by slave trading as an unconscionable evil. Their belief that the slave trade was a constant source of war was an orthodox line of reasoning through the early 19th century. Even some who could not condone slave revolt could condemn slaveholder tyranny. In 1764, a Boston writer asserted that West Indian planters were used to an arbitrary and cruel government over their slaves, having for so long tasted the sweets of oppressing their fellow creatures. That sentiment reverberated strongly in James Otis's Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved, published the same year. His defense of the rights of American settlers from the intimidation of imperial administration declared that colonists are, are by the law of nature freeborn, as indeed all men are, white or black. In England, people mocked American colonists' pretensions to being oppressed by invoking Americans' brutality toward the enslaved. In the early years of the American Revolution, the literary celebrity Samuel Johnson famously raised a toast to the next slave rebellion in the West Indies at an Oxford dinner party. By the end of the century then, stories of revolts against slaveholders and the gruesome executions of slave rebels had helped to promote an emerging anti-slavery consciousness, which ultimately enabled the campaigns that turned the British public against the slave trade and slavery in the 19th century. But this all happened too late for the rebels themselves. Like most slave insurrections, Taki's war ended badly. The insurgents were killed or captured, publicly executed in grisly displays or banished from the island, probably along with many bystanders who had taken no part in the fighting. Looking back with a historian's perspective, one can imagine that the outcome was never in doubt. The balance of forces doomed the rebellion from the start. The Coromantes would not win the colony from the British as the North Americans would do two and a half decades later and as the Haitians would do by 1804, taking Saint-Domingue from the French. But the rebels in Jamaica did not know they would fail. They acted with the hope of success. Even amid the business of war and enslavement in a colony garrisoned for battle with foreign and domestic enemies, they could find fissures in the landscape of planter power beyond the reach of the slaveholders' whips. They could even challenge the combined forces of the British Empire and find an enduring place in popular memory. Tacky's revolt and its reverberations through the 1760s represented a watershed in the course of Atlantic history. If regional political maps had been drawn by the wars that opened new territories for cultivation, stimulated the slave trade and enhanced state power, the slave rebellions etched another record of historical movement. They channeled people into new solidarities and gave meaning to categories of belonging, partitioned friends from foes and bystanders and redirected the priorities of governing authorities. Since Jamaica was the commercial military hub of the British American empire, its most profitable settlement and most powerful overseas military stronghold, what happened there was bound to reverberate widely. Yet the legacy of the 1760s is ambiguous. At the close of the Seven Years' War, Britain kept its prized colony, though Tacky's revolt helped to stimulate that larger imperial reform effort that provoked the greater challenge on the North American continent. If Jamaican revolts in some ways anticipated the Haitian Revolution, offering a beacon of hope to the enslaved, they also left Black people on the island divided. The Coromantes augmented their reputation as formidable fighters, helping to cast doubts on the wisdom of continuing the transatlantic slave trade, while at the same time strengthening the association between Blackness and social danger. Even in the United States, as late as the mid 19th century, anxious slaveholders referred to potential troublemakers as tackies among us. Perhaps the ambiguous nature of these legacies helps to explain why they register so faintly in the imagination today beyond Jamaica. The Coromanti Wars that shaped the era don't fit neatly into the prevailing narrative of the rise and progress of liberal freedom, even though such small dirty wars epitomize the relationship between labor, commerce, and global power. They are obscured by the more obvious consequences of the American and Haitian revolutions, which seem to speak more directly to the Western history of liberty. The relative obscurity of these events is also due to the reluctance to acknowledge slave revolt as an act of war. Few things terrify the wealthy and powerful more than the prospect of losses to the poor and weak, which would signify a world turned upside down. Dominant peoples and nation states develop elaborate conventions for legitimating conflict 
maintaining their honor in victory and defeat, and recognizing violence as a regular, if unfortunate, feature of political struggle. Between the powerful and those they dominate by daily habit, there is no limit to the lengths they may go to maintain their supremacy. They will commit atrocities and massacres to be sure, but they will disavow them too. They will refuse to admit that their combatants are legitimate enemies, and they will denigrate the past and present struggles of less powerful peoples. Because slaveholders wrote the first draft of this history, subsequent historiography has strained to escape from their point of view. What we must fully recognize, and what I hope I've conveyed this evening, is how events in far-flung and seemingly disconnected places had consequences in other ostensibly isolated locales. How the process of forced migration from Africa in a world of imperial warfare shaped the history of America in surprising ways. The uprisings of the 1760s in Jamaica can justly be narrated as stories of heroism and defeat. But in their courage and ingenuity, these insurgents also charted the landscape of force and its limitations that the maps of the powerful never meant to show. These counter mappings reveal a geography of hope and possibility in the making. Fugitive territories carved out through political struggle that were difficult to maintain and are in most cases yet to be won. Thank you. I believe we have some time for Q&A uh, and so I'll stop sharing my screen now uh, and then we can, uh, we can get on with that. Thank you very much for that incredible presentation. So I will be of serve as a moderator. In fact, I can start off with a question. Um, look at your work in Gerald Horn's work, Counter Revolution. Yeah. And, uh, and really, how one sees, <clears throat> and we can get into it. So these Africans, right? You always hear people say Africans are kings and queens, and and but obviously it's more nuanced and complicated. These were actual warriors that came up with these skill sets. The King's West Hemisphere and kind of disrupted the, the the England was a major imperial power, the French and the Spaniards, and they also used Africans in the imperial wars. So, so how do we go Absolutely. about changing that whole narrative? When we teach slave, we teach uh, uh, this section to undergrads because this is this very flat way we do this 19th century history, where we don't see all this nuance and what roles these Africans played in disrupting this imperial power. Because in our mind. It's just white power all the time and African men just sitting around, hanging out. Stone Rebellions is aberration. Nat Turner's aberration, you know, uh, uh, Gabriel Pross aberration, but it's, it's a larger history. How do we go about getting that to undergrads in this major picture, this major point? So one of the ways that I try to do that is by reframing. So kind of one of the problems that you identified is, you know, first of all, we think of the history of Black people in America as the history of Black people in the United States and then that as the history of slavery in the antebellum US South. Mm -hmm. So this period of about kind of 30 years, 40 years before the Civil War becomes like our entire understanding of the history of slavery. We don't really think about the colonial period. We don't really think about the Atlantic world. We don't really think about African history as mattering at all, right? And so if we're taking that 40 year slice and then just, then, then obviously what we're gonna come up with is, you know, all we know about the history of the enslaved is the history of slavery in that very small period. You have to expand the canvas, expand the framework, and look at how that society itself, that few decades of US history, which is important because the United States by the mid 19th century becomes the largest slave society in the history of the world, right? Rivaling only ancient Rome. But that emerges from a larger context and we have to resituate that in this larger understanding of the Atlantic world. Now, when we think <clears throat> about colonial America, right? Of course, most people think about the 13 colonies that became the United States, because again, they're only doing the prehistory of the United States. They're not thinking about the history of the British Empire as a whole, which had 26 colonies on the eve of the American Revolution. And by far, as I said, and I keep saying, the most important of those colonies were those colonies in the Caribbean, Jamaica being the principal colony there. Once we do that, we have to reorient our understanding of early America not just as the prehistory of the United States, but as the history of the British Empire competing with these other empires, most notably the French Empire, the Spanish Empire, but also the Dutch and the Portuguese. So like the world just becomes bigger. And you frankly understand the United States better 
and I don't think you can understand it at all without understanding how it emerges from the rest of the world. You understand the United States better when you understand this larger world from which that nation state emerges, because you're then understanding the process, right, of struggle that lends itself to that emergence. So to your second point, right, that then raises the question, I think provokes the question, who are all of these people coming to the Americas, building up these most profitable societies, right? And, you know, historians of the slave trade and slavery in early America know that where Europeans learned to exploit African labor, that's where they made the most money, right? The chart that I showed you is not an anomaly. Where you had the large integrated plantations, especially those growing sugar and other agricultural commodity crops for, crops for export, like coffee, that's where the planters got really rich. And then, you know, colonists in Massachusetts served as kind of adjunct to that broader imperial economy headquartered in the Caribbean. That is why down to about 1800, about three quarters of all the people who migrated to the Americas migrated from Africa, right? Now we know a lot more about the history, the European histories of those European migrants who came to America. What do we know about the history that those people experienced and brought with them? Those people who made up the vast majority of migrants to the Americas down to about 1800 during that early period. Well, that's the work that we're doing now. And that goes directly to your question is we have to go back and learn more about the African history, the history of African polities and states, African struggles in their engagement with the Europeans, right? To understand the world that these people came from. And yes, one of the primary ways that Europeans helped to stimulate the slave trade was to flood the zone with, with weapons to increase the scale and lethality of the pre-existing African conflicts that helped to produce those captives for sale. Anywhere between half and probably two thirds of all the people who were caught up in the transatlantic slave trade were either captured in wars or were displaced as a consequence of war, state collapse and famine uh, and disruption uh, and refugee crisis, because to, you know, in order to capture people, you had to disconnect them from their community networks of kin and care. That's how they become vulnerable to enslavement. That's how people become vulnerable to enslavement today, right? When, when there's war in their territories and their states are disrupted and their families are destroyed, that's when they become vulnerable to the traders, right? To the human traffickers. Those people bring experience with them. And many of them, because, because the, the, the slave trade made West, Africa, uh, West African warfare endemic, came with military skills. And those military skills, you know, were not forgotten, were not abandoned when they arrived in the Americas. So to understand this larger history of slave revolt, one has to understand that African history that I talked about in this and that I spend a lot more time going into in the book. Thank you. Here's a question. I'm a Windward Maroon. My grandfather was the last one of the last chiefs in Moortown, Jamaica. Can All you right. see Maroon communities today and how their presence continues this legacy? Yeah. So, I mean, so some, you will certainly know, and some of you will know, and the Maroons are a very big part of the story that I told, not in the, not in the talk that I gave today, but a very big part of the book. Because um, for those who don't know, uh, Maroons started as communities of, of formerly, uh, uh, former slaves who had escaped, and then they fought campaigns to maintain their freedom. And so in the period, a couple decades before Tacky's Revolt, uh, the Maroons of Jamaica fought a, a major war that lasted about a decade where the British didn't even know they would be able to keep the island. So they had to sue the Maroons for peace in 1739 and sign treaties with them. And the Maroons were granted their autonomy in the mountainous regions, autonomy that, that they have maintained today. Um, but at the same time, this is a kind of crucial for the story that I tell, the, the treaties obligated the Maroons diplomatically to suppress future slave revolts which in the case of Taki's revolt, many did. And so what you have to do then to understand that history is take black politics seriously mm. and not assume as Professor Canton was saying that you know the, the, the major and only important cleavage is the cleavage between white and black. One has to understand, right? That black people have their own concerns, their own struggles before they even get to white people. <laughs> and that to understand that black pol internal black politics is crucial to understanding the way the politics of slavery and slave revolt plays out. And certainly like the fact that the kind of Maroons remain um, independent and in some ways autonomous, even from the government of Jamaica today, uh, 
gives you some indication of how hard fought that history was in the 17th and 18th century. How does your work, this is from Paul Ortiz, how does your work challenge the traditional historiography of slavery and the American Revolution? Sheila says, hey. Hey, Sheila, and hey, Paul. Um, well, I mean, can, so one of the debates we've been having about slavery in the American Revolution is, um, I think, emerging from the 1619 Project, and the question is kind of, you know, did Virginia slaveholders and thereby kind of American revolutionaries more generally revolt in some way to maintain slavery? And the, the nugget of truth of that is that, you know, in 1775, when the British governor of Virginia says, announces that, you know, slaves who run away from their plantations and get to British lines will be free, right? And he'll put them to work fighting and suppressing the rebellion that really incenses the Virginia slaveholders and helps to tip them toward revolution in 1775, right? So that, that, is, that is important to remember. And that work, you know, you see it in Woody Holton's earlier work on the American Revolution in a book called Force Founders. You see it in his new book, Liberty is Sweet. And that's, that's crucial. What I don't think you can do is extend that to an understanding of, of the American revolutionaries in general, because the American revolutionaries in Massachusetts were already there, right? Had different ideas and weren't so dependent on, on, on slavery in the first place. And then, right, when you add in the Caribbean and when you look at what's happening in those territories where 90% of the population is enslaved, the Jamaicans don't think that revolution against the British Empire, the revolt against the British Empire is going to help maintain slavery at all. In fact, they understand that their society is contingent, is dependent on the maintenance of slavery by British troops. So again, as I, as I, as I gave my earlier answer to Professor Canton, if you only think of you know, the American Revolution in terms of North America, you're going to make arguments like that, that, you know, that mistake right, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a correlation for a cause. One can say that it was important to Virginia, it was, it, was, it, was, it was incensing to Virginians that the British were willing to make that announcement. But one cannot say that, therefore, that's the American Revolution in total, because the Jamaican case, I think, falsifies that. Right? For them, staying within the British Empire was the way to protect slavery. The British Empire was not turning abolitionists by any means in the 1770s. Right? The Somerset case that happened in 1772, which irritated Jamaican colonists even more than it irritated anybody in Virginia or Massachusetts, right, was not enough. And in fact, British slavery became more profitable and increased its numbers. The slave trade increased through the 1790s, right? Up until, um, uh, up until the slavery was abolished in the early, it's like the slave trade was abolished in the early uh, uh, 19th century. So again, one has to kind of paint that broader picture and look at the American Revolution on that broader canvas, I think in order to settle that question with any satisfaction. Was Tacky's rebellion a therapeutic insurgency? Did healing and healers ignite technologies, knowledge, and sentiments? Okay, I'm not sure what's meant by a therapeutic insurgency, but the second part of the question I do understand, which is that, you know, shamans, uh, uh, obeah men in this case, people who were uh, spiritual adepts and practitioners were crucial to administering loyalty oaths and helping to boost the morale of the rebels, right? So it's kind of, it was, they were kind of crucial to the organization of the revolt at its beginnings and all the way through. And in fact, the capture and execution of many of the shamans um, was one of the ways that the British were actually able to suppress the revolt. Now, I hasten to add that, you know, the British Royal Navy, when they went into battle, would always, would always read the code of war, the articles of war to their soldiers. And the very first thing in the articles of war was oath, an oath to adherence to the Church of England. Right? So kind of one can see the kind of religious function in the battle among British soldiers too, going into battle, as one can see with the Africans. Certainly different gods, different techniques, different spiritual practices and practitioners, but a similar kind of process of helping to boost the morale and, 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 and adhere um, the troops into a kind of, into a loyal unit performed by these religious adepts. What types of material evidence remain that reveal the use of military tactics and knowledge as well as communication from Taki's rebellion? In what ways did such evolve over time? 
So I, so, I mean, this is a question for archaeologists, and I, I haven't done a kind of archaeological research on this, but certainly, I mean, you know, the enslaved soldiers were, when they could, using the same guns that, that British troops and British militia members had. Um, you see, certainly, there's a fort. One of the first um, battles of Tacky's Revolt was the taking of Fort Haldane in the parish of St. Mary in the north of the island. That fort still stands. That fort still exists. Um, one of the things I would like to do is organize an archaeological dig at what was called the Rebels Barricade, which is in the parish of Westmoreland, on the western side of the island, uh, up in the mountains. And there you can see where the rebels thought that they could create a new independent maroon community, because that Rebels Barricade was in a semi-detached mountain range, distant from the maroons who were allied with the British, but also up strategically situated above the planters in the plains. And you can see how there they thought they would be able to defend themselves long enough to establish their own autonomy and perhaps force the British to sue for peace as the Maroons had in 1739. All right, we have four minutes and these are last two questions. Which pre-colonial African stories would you most recommend to convey to students? Oh, well, I certainly think this one's a good one. <laughs> um, I do think the, the story of Takis Revolt is great. I also think that everybody should, you know, should know something about the Haitian Revolution. Um, and there's no better place to start than CLR James Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture and the San Domingo Revolution. And then if you want a more, uh, more recent account, there's Laurent Dubois' Avengers of the New World, the story of the Haitian Revolution, which I think is a, is a book that holds up really well. Last question. Thank you for the amazing presentation. During your talk, I kept thinking about Cedric Robinson's Black radical tradition. How do you situate your work in reframing of colonial history that Robinson argues leads to Black Marxism? Great, 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 great question. I mean, I think in, in Robinson's critique of, of Marxism um, <clears throat> and his critique of kind of Black Marxists who had, who, had, who had disconnected themselves from this larger tradition of Black struggle against oppression, he was, he was pointing to just the kinds of rebellions that I like to highlight, right? When Robinson talked about how kind of fundamental struggles for black dignity through slavery, against slavery and against white oppression, he was talking, when he, when he talked, his term was the ontological totality. What that was for him was an understanding, right? The resistance was a constituent component part of, of black being in the Americas. And these slave revolts were a fundamental part of that, right? So I think you have to study these to understand what Robinson meant by the ontological totality of, 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 of Black being uh, in its resistance to white oppression. Now for those amazing answers. And I turn over the mic to, to Matt Jacobs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brown, for that great presentation and, and for your responses uh, to those wonderful questions. And thank you, uh, David Canton, for moderating this uh, as well. Uh, this obviously, is, as I said at the start, is one in a series of events uh, that originated in undergraduate exploration of the relationship between the founding of the University of Florida and the history of slavery in the state of Florida. And so uh, there's much to connect to what uh, Dr. Brown was discussing here this evening. I also uh, would like to thank again our sponsors and co-sponsors for this, uh, and they've been with us for the whole series, and this has been uh, wonderful. The Dr. Patricia Hillier Nunn Sankofa Initiative, the Proctor Oral History Program, the History Department, Political Science Department, African American Studies Program, and the Rothman Endowment in the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere. This talk will be posted on the uh, Graham Center's YouTube channel within the coming days, so if you want to share it with friends, it will be accessible. Uh, there. So uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, and again, thank you very much, Dr. Brown. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, and for those wonderful questions. We hope you have a good evening. Good evening.